Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you along to our monthly webinar series and our September uh, offering of this webinar series, the title of which is The Impact of Alcohol on Our Mental Health. Um, and I'm just, as of after giving the introduction, I'll just allow a, a minute, uh, 30 seconds to a minute, for people to uh, join the group before uh, I introduce myself and our contributor for this month's uh, webinar. Okay. So yeah, as I said, I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, for this uh, conversation that uh, myself, we have two Stevens in the room this afternoon, myself, Stephen McBride, the Director of Services at AWARE, and I'm delighted to uh, be joined by Stephen Rohn, Addiction Therapist, Facilitator and Lecturer. And just before I introduce, uh, to come across to, to Stephen, just to say that AWARE, we're here to provide support, education and information for people who are impacted by depression, bipolar disorder, and other mood-related conditions. And as part of that mission, uh, our, our task and our desire is to inform people about uh, mental health more generally. And in this instance, uh, today, the discussion with Stephen will centre on the impact of uh, alcohol on our mental health. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Stephen Rowan to, to the audience this afternoon. Well, it's very nice to be here. I have great regard for the AWARE organization and I just many thanks for the welcome here today. Um, I, I'd like to let those of you who are tuning in to know a little bit about where I come from. I am originally from the US, that's probably obvious from my accent, uh, but I've lived in Ireland a total of about 25 years. So I'm quite familiar with the system of how we provide mental health services, addiction services, general overall health care. Uh, that doesn't mean I have loads of answers, but I mean, I just, I'm quite familiar with what typically people come up against when they're looking for support of one type or another. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in the field of addiction really quite full time since the late 1970s. I've been around a long time, originally trained as a social worker, became very interested in the drug scene uh, early on, while well, still living and working in the U.S., uh, in terms of noticing the impact of, of substances on the lives of young people, young adults. That's kind of how I began my career in this field. And then spent a couple of years working with the founder of the Rutland Center, uh, a, a man who was both a priest and a psychologist named Raphael Short. Uh, he was a very interesting man, a very dynamic, charismatic individual. And I learned a lot from him and from those early years when we set up uh, the Rutland Center. It was a very special time in my life. Then I was back in the US getting advanced training in group psychotherapy for three years, doing other work as well, some of it in private practice, and then back here in Ireland since the year 2000. Uh, initially as director of the Rutland Center, and then I left there in 2008 and have been in private practice ever since. Uh, so, I mean, that's it. I, I am a uh, clinical member of the Addiction Councils of Ireland. I'm an accredited supervisor, and most of the work I do is in the realm of, of the impact of alcohol and other substances and other addictive behaviors on individuals, but also on their families. A lot of the work I do, I do a lot of work with Francis Black and the RISE Foundation. Mm -hmm. RISE Foundation only works with family members impacted by substance misuse uh, and other addictions. So a lot of the, the interest I have isn't just with the person who's directly impacted by their own overuse of alcohol. It's the knock-on effect on families, on partners, parents, uh, kids of all ages, uh, not just young kids, but particularly young kids. So we're, we have a lot of interest in the area. And I promise you who are listening today, I don't have all the answers, but I think we have some ideas, some strategies of what might be helpful if you're struggling mm -hmm. at home or someone you care about is struggling at home 
with overuse of alcohol and the resultant impact on that person's well-being, on their struggle with depression, perhaps a very deep, dark type of depression, some suicidality, perhaps, uh, serious anxiety. Now, one of the things that alcohol does, alcohol is like quick relief for anxiety. It has kind of a, initially, kind of a sedative or tranquilizing effect. But then when it wears off, it can leave the nerves very raw, the person very agitated, sometimes angry, sometimes full of regret. Uh, all, but the depression gets worse, the anxiety gets worse. So I'm really, really happy to talk about this topic with you today. I noticed uh, the other Stephen mentioned bipolar disorder. That would mm. be one of the groups that this AWARE program helps support, which is tremendous. Um, people with bipolar disorder, for example, may not at all be addicted to alcohol, but they're kind of misusing alcohol almost as medication for their bipolar disorder. And it, and it makes things worse. Mm. Um, mm. So that's something I really want to emphasize today. You're struggling with a diagnosis of bipolar or bipolar two. Really go easy on the drink not only because it can make things worse just in general, but it also wa kind of waters down or weakens the effect of appropriate medication that you might be prescribed. Mm -hmm. So there's just an awful lot of, of ins and outs around alcohol. Uh, for many people, they're better off with no alcohol. Others mm -hmm. can use it and use it carefully and wisely, live a very long life, live very well, but in in, in moderation, and I mean light moderation. Mm -hmm. Light moderation mm -hmm. doesn't mean a half a dozen pints of Guinness or two bottles of wine. Moderation means really what the Irish College of General, General Practitioners highlights, which is like 17 units for men. Um, mm -hmm. They may have even reduced that a bit, 11 units for women or maybe 14 units for women. Those, those guidelines change a little bit. But we're talking about a modest amount of alcohol just for anybody, whether or not you struggle with mental health difficulties. So yeah. I'm quite ready to talk about addiction, but most people who participate or engage or struggle with alcohol-related harm are not addicted mm. to alcohol. So if you're not addicted, you might think you have the green light to, to drink, 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 drink to soothe the distress of life mm -hmm. because you're struggling with depression, anxiety, with boredom, with frustration, with uh, just incredible levels of stress. When in fact, it doesn't work well if you go beyond kind of a light, moderate level of consumption. So we can talk about any of these things that, that where you have interest, if I'll do my best to. Yeah. you know, provide some helpful ideas. Great. Thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks, Stephen. And I'm looking forward to this yeah, uh, wide ranging in the time that we have conversation. And just yeah. to say uh, that there's a question and answer box for you as participants and people who are joining us for this webinar to uh, offer some thoughts and ask a question, which I will field uh, with Stephen later on in, in the hour together. And one, when we plan this webinar series, Stephen, we, we think about the timings of the year. And I suppose for September, it's uh, the second start of the year, if you put it that way. It's the start of the academic year for all the students and young people. And one of the uh, thoughts that we had in preparing uh, for September's webinar was the idea of that transition time, you know, and without making it exclusively about uh, young people or young adults, but that idea of people coming to reckon with their social lives and people at university age or people just at a point of transition in their lives. And uh, you've spoken to it and touched on it, the, the impact that alcohol can have on mental health if it's not uh, uh, moderated, you know, or if it isn't uh, given due regard. How does a person come to, do you think, give it that due regard? What, what kind of ideas do you have around that? When, when does someone become more aware? How can we develop awareness, I suppose? Well, I'm, we're probably never aware enough, um, mm. but, but 
you know, I think it's some of it's trial and error. I mean, generally people in their 30s and 40s, for example, drink less than people who are 20 or 25 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of realize that you know, it takes its toll on their energy. It just disturbs their sleep. They feel flat or washed out if they've drank too much. So ideally, when people overdo it, when they're young and foolish, they learn their, from experience uh, how to tone it down mm -hmm. and kind of become more sensible. I mean, I think this is true for those who don't become addicted because those who become addicted to alcohol, they're more likely to drink more when they're 30, 35 and 40 than mm -hmm. they did when they were 20 or 25, university age or kind of new young adults out in the work world. Um, but, but, you know, we really need to not just um, make a joke of it. I mean, there's, there's a bit of a stereotype and I, I don't mean to rely too much on stereotypes, mm. but when people gather around the water cooler on a Monday morning in the office, for those listening today who remember those days before people were working from home, mm. um, and there would be always a bit of humor around drinking too much on the weekend on the, you know, the, oh, it was desperate and uh, mm. the crack was mighty and all that. And although I, I deeply appreciate the Irish sense of humor and the quick comebacks and the give and take, I think it's just part of the wonder of, of Irish culture. At mm. the same time, it's not funny when people consume a quantity of alcohol that actually converts to poison if it's excessive amounts of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So the person, you know, is a bit of a banter and all of that. And it's all done in, 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 you know, to be kind of, uh, it's a way of kind of bonding uh, with mm -hmm. colleagues and all when you get back to work the next week. But it really can, it, it's at a level that's poisonous for the human body and for the human mind. Mm -hmm. We begin to feel like we need that relief. We need that numbing effect. Mm -hmm. We need to medicate the stress of boredom or overwork or overwhelming needs of kids that we mm -hmm. are trying to raise as best we can. Um, we really need to increase our awareness. There's a lot of good information on the internet. Um, there's a lot of good information available. We, we're a bit stuck with mm -hmm. some old stereotypes, for example, most films and movies that we watch, TV programs, don't mention the topic of alcohol. There's a lot of alcohol advertising, but the content of the TV shows, for example, or films, don't usually make that much reference to alcohol. But when they talk about someone with a severe alcohol problem, mm. the, the character in the, in the film or the TV program is very severely addicted. They're mm. chronically addicted. They drink day and night. They cause extreme problems for themselves and their families. Now that does happen. There are mm. chronic alcoholics who are in the very advanced stage of alcoholism. And that is a mental health issue. And it's a physical well-being issue because sure. a person could die from that kind of uh, mm. overuse of alcohol. Alcohol misuse contributes to about 13 different kinds of cancers in plus cirrhosis of the liver. Mm. But that's what we see on the TV, on the screen. But, but most alcoholics are not chronic, but 80% mm. of them are so-called functional alcoholics. But then you have studies that have confirmed that most alcohol-related harm, and I know I said this earlier, mm. most alcohol-related harm is consumed by people who are not addicted. And that's really, I think, something I hope the participants in today's discussion yeah. will really take on board. That if you're working, if you're a therapist, for example, or a therapist in training, and you're working with your clients, if you've reached the conclusion that they don't have an addiction, it doesn't mean that they're not misusing alcohol. That you drink too much to conk out at night because you're so anxious and uptight and wary. Well, mm. that's not healthy. It disrupts mm. sleep, it disrupts proper nutrition. Um, mm. It aggravates without any doubt uh, those black moods, so that 
deep black hole we can get ourselves into. Um, mm. Even if it's not full-blown addiction, yeah, aggravate. And that, that's really quite significant. And then yeah. of course, when the alcohol wears off, it's like sandpaper on the nervous system mm. and people are anxious. And it's often a kind of a form of free floating anxiety. They, mm. they may not even know why they're anxious. Um, so that's really, really, really significant. Uh, yeah. If they're not addicted, alcohol is okay, but I emphasize light moderation, um, which yeah. is usually lighter than what people have in mind when they're listening to a discussion like this. Yeah, that's very helpful to make that distinction that it's not just the idea of someone who's dependent on alcohol or an alcoholic or engaged in you know, alcoholism, mm -hmm. but also the potential harm. And it's not about being moralistic in it, but it's about developing awareness around the potential harm for any user of alcohol if it goes uh, above in, on a consistent basis, a certain level, because there are the, that toll it'll take physically, a person's physical well-being, mm -hmm. but also the impact on their mental health. And I just wanted to draw that out a little bit more, Stephen, if we can, to think about how the impact of, say, um, alcohol on um, mental health and the impact of mental health on alcohol use, that kind of the, the connection between the two um, constructs or strands, mental health and alcohol and alcohol and uh, mental health, if, if that makes sense. Well, I, again, I don't, um, believe me, I, I don't believe I have all the, the answers. But what I do know is that alcohol is very powerful and it's very insidious. So if mm. you're feeling low, there's kind of an illusion that if I drink, I'll get some relief. And you may not get relief, but you very well may get some temporary relief. But the long-term effect is you're going to feel worse. Plus, there's some wonderful, wonderful antidepressant medication available today. I think we know more about how to medicate than ever before. Now, I don't believe everybody who's struggling with some level of depression definitely needs to be on prescribed medication, SSRIs and all that. I don't believe that's necessarily true. But in some cases, it's, it's, it's an absolute life-changing gift get on the right medication, the right dose for the right length of time. Well, mm -hmm. alcohol waters down the efficacy of the medication. So, mm -hmm. you know, you wind up trying to get some help for an authentic diagnosis of depression. You, 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 you know, you take your tablets maybe early in the day and then you're drinking later in the day and you're not getting the proper relief that the medication is intended to provide because of the alcohol in the system while the antidepressant in the system is trying to do its job. Uh, mm -hmm. is, I, I personally would recommend if people are struggling with any form of, of, of depression, mild, moderate, severe, I recommend they don't drink at all. Mm -hmm. I recommend um, clean eating, lots of exercise, mindfulness meditation, and I won't go off on a, you know, a, on a wellness sort of tangent, except to say, I think you're always better off without alcohol. Uh, you might not be worse off if you drink a little, but you're always at least no worse off if you don't drink at all, if that makes sense. Yeah, alcohol, it does indeed. for example, it's, it's very, very, if you're not well in your, in your mind, in your heart, in your thinking, in your feeling, if you're not well, that's a genuine illness. Mm. You need rest. You need genuine, proper rest. Very difficult to get good rest. Well, if you're drinking, it's gonna water, it's gonna, um, it's gonna interfere with the proper sleep cycle. Mm. It just will. You may drink and pass out or conk out. You're so anxious and exhausted and stressed and upset. It gives you some relief and you, and you kind of fall asleep on the couch or in your chair. Mm. But, but you wake up at three in the morning, not refreshed, not well rested, but wide awake and unable to get back to sleep. That's what excess alcohol does. Yeah. And I think even modest amounts of alcohol can have that result if you're struggling. Um, so please, you know, get, uh, join a support group. AWARE has amazing support groups get into proper counseling and psychotherapy. 
work with a, a knowledgeable uh, prescribing physician if you are so debilitated that you need to be appropriately medicated. Just because you're having a tough patch, going through a tough patch, doesn't mean you need lots of pills. But if it's a really tough patch and, you're, and you've been diagnosed as clinically depressed, medication may indeed be something you need, but don't ruin the effectiveness of it by drinking uh, at the same, you know, at, at, on the same day, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Mm. Mm. That's very helpful, Stephen, to, to, to hear you uh, talk about, you know, giving this cogent and kind of uh, uh, direct advice to people to sharpen and broaden their, their, their awareness around the impact of, of, of alcohol on our mood. Uh, and, and on our mental health, therefore. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to broaden it out a little bit and, and think about, um, you know, I suppose the first social unit that we uh, live in mm -hmm. and identify with being our family. Uh, yes. Whatever the makeup of any participant in this webinar's uh, family is and all the broad mm -hmm. and uh, different uh, family makeups that we come from, you know, what do you see as being the, the main uh, or the main impacts uh, that the role alcohol can play on the mental health of the family system? Well, I, I think alcohol, particularly in excessive amount, it makes people very isolated hmm. from each other, including from the people they love. Hmm. So there, there can be tremendous conflict within the family or tremendous distance hmm. one from another in the family. Uh, it may not be a hostile environment, but people can almost live parallel lives, very separate mm -hmm. from each other. Yes, they're under one roof. They live at the same postal address, but they're not as connected as they should be for mm -hmm. just to feel like you belong, you're connected, you're, you're, you mean something to those around you. That you, you. You matter to the people you live with and they matter to you. I think excessive use of alcohol, overuse of alcohol, not necessarily addiction. I think it really puts distance between people. Mm -hmm. um, it, can, it can contribute to arguments and rows and um, bickering and all of that also. Yeah. But, but, but the, remember, when people get addicted to alcohol, they're always, even if they're the life of the party, they're always isolated. Um, and recovery is about connection. Mm -hmm. Sure. It, it's all about connection, and mm. you know, appropriate with appropriate boundaries and so forth. Yeah. Um, mm. So it, 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 it's a really, really important theme, I think, that if I have kids growing up, they don't need to walk in my footsteps. And if my, if, if I'm walking in the foot in the footsteps of over drinking, depressed, agitated, bored, uptight, overstressed, and I use alcohol to medicate, alcohol to medicate. My kids don't need to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, they start to feel like my, my drinking uh, means more to me if I were the one over drinking. Mm -hmm. It means more to me than, than they do. They mm -hmm. feel like they don't matter. And what mm -hmm. impact is it on a child if the mm -hmm. child feels like they don't matter or they don't matter enough or they don't matter very much? Now, children have to learn that they are not the center of the entire universe, but they do have to experience believing that they're treasured, that they're, that they're held in love. Um, mm. They're honored for their goodness and their dignity and all mm. about the wonder of being a human person. Mm. All of that has to be experienced by a child growing up, mm -hmm. even if they're doing their little power struggles about bedtime or power struggles about curfews when they get it, when kids get older and they're teenagers and all that. Um, but when you start having a parent who overdrinks or kids who overdrink, the kids who, uh, and I know it's somewhat inevitable that kids will experiment with alcohol as teenagers, mm -hmm. but no youngsters school performance was ever improved by drinking at age 14, 15, mm. when the human brain isn't even fully formed yet. Sure. It's very hard to convince young people not to go near alcohol to their 21, because the human brain's probably not fully developed until they're 21. Mm. So there's just an awful lot of food for thought here.
There is indeed. There is indeed. And thank you, Stephen. I'm just struck by how uh, passionately and uh, and such a humane way to, to, to put this in relation to, I, I suppose, not, not just the impact of alcohol and mental health, but relationships. And I suppose this idea that recovery from uh, alcohol dependence or if someone has a, even a, you know concern about their moderate use of alcohol and wants to temper that or reduce that, that it has a, a, a positive impact not only on their own mental health but the social relationships they have or the familial relationships they have and and, and just to hang around that little point for a minute if there's a, anyone in, in in the in the audience this afternoon you know that's wondering about having that conversation or thinking about broaching that topic with their loved one um you know what what kind of thoughts have you got on on that um because obviously there's the dynamic in a relationship when when alcohol might be an issue or if it's becoming impactful to use that word again. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep, come up with a good example. If a person uh, has diabetes or some cancer diagnosis, you know, there's scientific proof that they've got a problem. Mm. You know, the results from a biopsy or a lab result we're talking about physical health in those examples. Mm. So the doctor, hopefully with, <clears throat> with good communication skills, the physician will explain the diagnosis and what needs to be done. Mm. But it's, it's, it's black and white. You have a physical problem called diabetes or such and such a cancer. With alcohol problems, it, it's much more difficult because alcohol, it's almost like it has a voice of its own. Now, I don't mean this scientifically or literally, but it's as if it had a voice of its own. Mm. And it's telling the person, you're fine. You need this. You deserve a break. You've, you've tried hard to, why not? Go ahead, indulge. And you know, again, I'm not talking about full-blown addiction necessarily, mm. but alcohol tells the person, you're not overdoing it, overusing it, meaning alcohol. Mm -hmm. Alcohol tells the person they're not overdoing it, even though they very well may be. Um, and I just really think people have to think, are there other ways I can deal with my distress? Can I connect with a therapist? Uh, can I connect with others struggling with similar struggles? Mm -hmm. The power the therapeutic, the therapeutic power of a support group is unbelievable. Mm. It's absolutely life-changing. Mm. Mm. Um, we've become a very individualized society. And some there are all kinds of support groups. AA is a is a is a support group of, of one type. Mm. The support groups uh, led by aware is another type. Mm. Um, there's a there's a whole range. There's not a huge number of group psychotherapy groups uh, available, but if you can find one, tremendous therapeutic power in those groups mm. because you're connecting with people who are very similar to you and very different from you at the same time. Mm. It's a very intense, very in-depth, very rich uh, personal experience for you as a member of a group. Mm. Um, there's great hope in that. So you've got options like meditation. Mm. Um, the big the buzzword now is mindfulness meditation, calming the beast within, not with a tranquilizer yes. or a sedative like alcohol, but calming it through your own, the, the power of your own mind. There's great support with the one-on-one -on -one counseling. There's great support in some form of a therapeutic group. There's a great deal to be said for walking at least 5,000 steps a day, you know, maybe roughly two, two and a half, three miles a day. Um, these are tremendous ways to improve your physical well being, but also to improve your mental well being without overly being overly reliant on alcohol as a kind of a mm -hmm. soother. Um, yes, strong advocate for that. And whether you have mild or moderate or severe mental health issues, what I've just said applies. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, thanks, Stephen. That's very helpful to hear. I suppose I was just uh, thinking about the idea of what we do at AWARE is to support, inform and educate. And as part of that, just to echo that, is that we do so in a general sense with, the, with all our volunteers across the services we provide uh, speaking, you know, quite consistently in an ongoing way about the importance of exercise, sleep and diet, which you're saying right. is... Uh, uh, clearly impacted by um, moderate a- and or uh, excessive alcohol use or even, you know, more than modest. And I like that word modest, light and modest. And, and the importance for our audience, perhaps, you know, to, to think about that, you know, and to kind of uh, develop some awareness or a new understanding of yeah, the impact and role alcohol has on our mental health. It's not a benign, neutral factor, I suppose, is one of the clear takeaways I'm taking from this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 indeed. I suppose I was wondering a little bit, uh, just to, to bring the conversation on a, a, a little bit, Stephen, um, you know, in, in relation to what you think, you know, I suppose you, you're, uh, you, 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 you've, you're, said you're an American man from America and you've spent a lot of your life living your adult life living in Ireland and what do you think you know societally about Ireland and and the relationship people in Ireland have with alcohol you've alluded to it a bit earlier around this idea of banter or the water cooler conversations or she wasn't it desperate and it's kind of that, that perhaps our, our relationship with alcohol is trivialized a bit or underplayed well, I mean, I think we are, my understanding, and, and I'm not a statistics person, I'm not, I, I deal with people who are already in trouble with alcohol. I try to provide effective therapeutic support for family members of those impacted mm. um, by usually alcohol, sometimes it's one of the other addictions. Um, but my understanding is that alcohol consumption in Ireland has come down somewhat. And some of that, I think, has to do with COVID and the pubs were closed. We do know that many people, many people with an alcohol problem, simply mm. drank more at home. But overall consumption has come down. Mm. I don't know if that's exclusively due to COVID, and that'll simply gradually fade away, the, the, and we'll get back to where we were in terms of overuse of alcohol as a people, as a mm. society. Hmm. Or if we're beginning to gradually become a little more health conscious, a little wiser, I think so. Uh, Yes. uh, We still have a heck of a lot of alcoholics and we have a heck of a lot of people struggling with stress and distress and bitter loneliness, uh, Hmm. boredom. We Hmm. have a lot of people, far too many people in pain, deep, intense, emotional pain. Mm. Uh, and they're relying too often on alcohol for relief. I don't yeah. want to water that down at all. But as a general, as society in general, I think we're becoming a little bit more wellness oriented. Mm. We're a little more careful uh, about considering it funny if people drink and drive. I mean, I, I remember when I first lived in Ireland in the 70s, mm. people would often have drinks at lunchtime and go back to work. Mm. That actually, it's not on. And mm. when I moved back here in the year 2000, mm. when, I, when I took up, took over as director of the Rutland Center, which were which is such a very special place for me to have spent mm. a good part of my life, um, that was not on anymore. People weren't drinking at the lunch hour. Mm. Mm. So I think gradually we're getting a little bit more informed, better educated, a little more careful. When I say we, I mean overall in terms of averages, but yes. there's still far too many people who are in a lot of pain, deep emotional pain. And the, they, they do something very human. They look for relief, but mm. alcohol will not give them the kind of relief uh, that will really benefit them in the yeah. long run. Which makes it, as you said, and I think you used the word earlier, insidious, or the seductive very, nature of alcohol. Very, 
uh, that this would this will uh, reduce or this will have a positive impact on my experience of stress or distress you know which we all in life experience for one reason or another to do with as you've mentioned uh, the societal impact uh, of COVID-19 where we had to disconnect uh, and had to separate and to physically distance ourselves from loved ones and you know the impact of that on us at a, at a mental health perspective or psychologically you know um so it's this and, idea and that i we think on, yeah yeah no i think Stephen, if i could interrupt you apologies for doing so okay if if we've been forced to separate some people are actually quite anxious about reconnecting you know yes. like a lot of us are shy you go to a social event and it's fairly quiet you know there's a kind of a quiet murmuring conversation but then there's the first drink and then there's the second drink and there's the third drink and it gets louder and louder and the laughter is peeling off the, the ceiling and the walls um because we're kind of a shy people uh, meeting a lot of people we don't know that well and say a social and busy social environment like a party or christmas party the annual christmas party at work we really need to to kind of slow it down and, and and back off when people are coming out of covid there's that that shyness it may be amplified almost intensified because they're not used to routinely going out and mixing a not that they were naturally social butterflies but over many many years of living in the adult world they found a way to overcome their their shyness with a couple of drinks and lots of occasions when they had to mix with other people but after mm. covid we're used to not being required to mix mm. with other people as much we weren't mm. allowed to in restaurants and pubs we didn't exactly. have to go to work, most of us. I know nurses and physicians and physiotherapists and other people, and particularly in healthcare settings, did have to go to work, but a lot of people weren't even allowed to go to work. So we're, we're more isolated from each other. And what do you do? The social lubricant. Let's have more drinks to overcome that, that reluctance, that hesitation to mix with people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just powerful, insidious, and you use the word seductive, it's a very strong word, and a very good word. Uh, alcohol wants to consume you and me. You know, we think of ourselves as consuming alcohol. If we go a bit overboard for a little too much for a little too long, alcohol winds up consuming us. And that's something I think we all have to remember. Hey, Stephen, are you, are you, yeah, you're there. Is it was it my connection? I yeah, am. we're still here. Yeah, we're here. We're here. Great. Yeah, we're I'm back here. Yeah, yeah. But I just uh, there was a, there was a question that came in, and maybe to start to field uh, a couple of questions. And uh, there was a question that came in from a parent of a, a parent with teenage children, and about how to speak to that idea about uh, their child or children's relationship with alcohol, considering the impact that peers and the peer group has uh, uh, the, the core influence at that stage. So, so what kind of ideas you have around that, around to promote, I suppose, a positive and healthy uh, interaction between, between in, in that kind of milieu? Well, I think the first thing I would say to any parent is set a good example. Now that doesn't guarantee anything, but if you're, you as parents, you know, moms, dads, whatever, if the parents are overusing alcohol, it's really quite ridiculous to try to lecture or inspire your kids to be careful and, and not uh, experiment with alcohol or overdo it with alcohol until, they're, until they get to college or until they're 21 or 25 or whatever the magic number might be. So mm -hmm. set a good example, first and foremost. Um, I think this is one of the toughest things though about being a parent is the nature of adolescence is the child at 10 is extremely dependent typically on the parent and at 20 ought to be quite independent maybe they still because of the cost of housing and all and they're still in education at age 20 they're still living at home at, at 20 and i don't want kids not to be close to their parents but clearly at 20 they should be much more independent than they are at 10. so what do you get in between 
when the child is 14, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. They've got one foot in childhood and one foot, or they're trying to have one foot in a little bit of the adult world. So they're individuating mm -hmm. as, as, as therapists, we use the term individuating. They're becoming mm -hmm. their own more distinct, separate individual. You could say, well, they've always been individual. They've always had a mind of their own, but that becomes even more apparent. So it's a little bit sure. of a war of independence. It may be a quiet mm. war, but it's a war of independence around limits and boundaries and all that. So you're trying to set a good example. You're trying to highlight that the human brain does not fully develop until they're a lot older than they are. And that having a good education, and I know this sounds cliche, that having a good education is the ticket. It's not a guarantee, but it's a ticket to a good life, you know, a decent job. And consuming alcohol will not help you improve your academic performance. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of guidance. It's a little bit of wisdom. It's a little bit of encouragement. But I think at that stage, you're more of an advisor and somewhat of a limit setter but you can't be overly authoritarian or dictatorial because sure. that just, I think, creates the rebelliousness of yeah. the youngster, the young person, the 14, 15, 16 year old, kind of going yeah. in the opposite direction. Yeah, it, is, it exacerbates something, yes. Yeah. So yeah. it sounds like the person making this inquiry, the parent out there, that parent is clearly trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. and probably is doing and saying exactly the right things. And I congratulate mm. her for that. I think it was a, a mom, maybe it was a dad, but yeah. I congratulate them for their efforts. But even with the right effort, you may or may not get the right result. Yeah. And you just hang in there, love them, support them, protect them. You know, they're going to make mistakes. Uh, forgive them, but don't be too forgiving. There are consequences to reckless behavior and just mm. hang in there with them until hopefully, by the time they're 23, they come out the other end yeah. in a good, healthy, safe place in their lives. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, some wise words there indeed, Stephen. There was another contribution from a member of the, uh, of the audience who, who wanted to know a, a couple of questions, a couple of points around uh, whether there's um, genetic factors or a genetic, uh -huh. you know, that propensity around uh, becoming alcohol dependent or the impact of, of, of alcohol in, in that regard. And also uh, around gender, you know, uh, around tolerance levels for male and female, if you could think about both aspects. This is a really important question. It's natural for we humans to want to figure out why. Mm -hmm. And there is a cause for everything in the universe. But despite the fact that alcohol and alcohol problems have been part of the human experience for thousands of years, we don't yet have an absolute airtight uh, scientific certainty about precisely what causes alcoholism. However, mm. they discovered a particular genetic difference uh, uh, oh, roughly 30 or more years ago. And it, I, I don't even remember the name of this genetic difference. It's an allele mm. on a particular D2 receptor in the human genome. Mm. And people who have this slight human difference mm. are more likely to develop a problem with alcohol or compulsive gambling or severe um, food addiction. Mm. However, there are people with addiction that don't have this slight genetic difference. And there are people with the slight genetic difference who don't develop addiction to anything. But there's a greater likelihood of developing an addiction with this slight genetic difference. So one of the things I'm always asking my clients about is do you have a parent or a grandparent with a severe alcohol problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that leads into something else, because if you have a parent or a grandparent or perhaps a great grandparent that you never met who did have this genetic difference, maybe it, maybe it was passed through the generations. Mm -hmm. So now alcoholism or alcohol addiction or alcohol dependence shows up now two or three generations later. It sometimes skips a generation. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a possibility. 
there's another detail here though. Mm -hmm. If I'm raised by an alcoholic parent or I'm influenced significantly by an alcoholic grandparent, I am more likely to have had some degree of trauma in my life, in my early life. Mm -hmm. I didn't get what I needed because alcohol was more important to my dad or mom than, than I was. Alcohol took first place. I mm. took last place. Is, that's damaging to, mm. the, to the psyche, to the human mm. spirit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that trauma, what some people call the hole in the soul, mm. what's that, that, that's carried into adolescence and adult life. So now you discover alcohol as a 16 year old or as a 22 mm -hmm. year old, and it puts to sleep everything that makes you feel badly. Mm -hmm. Something, things you've felt badly about since you were two and four and five and six years of age, mm -hmm. long before you had your first drink. So the trauma piece is very important. I would encourage yeah. your listeners, mm -hmm. if they're interested, uh, there's, a, there's a physician uh, born in Hungary, spent most of his life in Vancouver. Mm. He's very well uh, regarded by therapists. He's yeah. done training on trauma, both in Belfast and in Cork. And his name is Dr. Gabor Mate, G-A-B-O-R-M-A-T-E. Yes. Mm. And he talks about that addiction is not the problem, it's the solution. Now, what does mm. he mean by that? What mm -hmm. he means is that people grow up with that, that sense of emptiness, that hole in the soul, that, that feeling that I, I, I don't matter or I don't matter very much. Mm -hmm. So I fill that emptiness mm -hmm. with a substance and, and the powerful substance such as alcohol mm -hmm. could be a different substance, could be an addictive behavior, but we fill it and we keep refilling it, but it never, it never does the trick. Mm -hmm. It never really satisfies the needs of the human human spirit, mm -hmm. but but it's really significant. His his video clips are available on YouTube. He's a wonderful speaker. He has mm -hmm. a high level of credibility, and he really believes that if you have a problem called trauma, particularly from earlier in life, then addiction or overuse of alcohol to keep mm -hmm. with the theme of today's discussion mm -hmm. that medicates that pain and in some cases the person becomes addicted in other cases they just overdo it and misuse it and probably just add to their misery mm -hmm. in the process um, so addressing trauma if, if that may be there from early in life is really the work of, of recovery not just recovery from addiction or recovery from those early painful losses that are experiences referred to as trauma. And I, I do want to add something, and I'll, I'll get please, to the end of piece please, in a minute. Yes. That that what's really significant is that we mm. have become very familiar, I believe, with the word trauma. Mm. But I think we use it too often. And by that I mean mm. if I'm uh, you know I'm happily married for decades, but if I was a young guy looking to find someone and I thought I found the, the right one for me. And that relationship never went anywhere. I, it, you know, I didn't find the right girl or whatever you want to say. I, I, that would be a huge disappointment. That, that could really be tough. Or if I went for a job, I really, really wanted this job and I didn't get it. That, that can be a very, very uh, difficult, um, mm heartbreak or yeah painful experience disappointment yeah. that is not trauma mm. now i suppose if i never found a job i liked in my life after years and years and years and years and years of non-stop disappointment and frustration or loneliness maybe there's an aggregate at some point where i i want to give up perhaps but when people have a, a setback it needs to be extreme to be trauma and if everything that's kind of difficult and disappointing in life is trauma, it, it loses its impact. Trauma is always extreme. It always cuts very deep. deep. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I believe a lot of people that AWARE provides support for mm. are people who have been traumatized. Mm. And maybe as a result of the trauma, they're drinking mm -hmm. too much, and maybe they're addicted from drinking too much. Maybe they're just drinking too much. However, deal with the trauma, get support, eat clean, drink very little or nothing at all. Mm. Um, learn to meditate, you know, honor your own value system, your own belief system, mm. uh, experience beauty where you can find it in the eyes of your child, mm. in the eyes of your beautiful child or in nature, find ways to connect as opposed to being isolated. But mm. a trauma is always extreme. And when mm. it is extreme, because mm. that's the nature of trauma, get help for yourself because you deserve it. Yeah. Now the gender piece, Mm -hmm. um, two quick things. The amount of alcohol consumed by men far exceeds that by women. And every treatment center that admits both men and women yes. admits more men than women. That the ratio is three to one. It used to be three to one when I was working in the Rutland Center with the founder in the early years. More recently, it's more like three to two. But the uh -huh. point is, more men have alcohol dependency and more men drink excessively than do women. That's just a mm -hmm. statistical fact. However, this a feminist might not like me saying this, but my understanding is that, that the woman's metabolism is such that a woman's body does not metabolize alcohol as efficiently as that of a man. And that's part of this one of a couple of reasons why women, the safe level of alcohol consumption in a given week for women uh, is less than for men. In part because yes. men generally are physically bigger, but also men are more efficient in the way in which their body mm. metabolizes alcohol mm. through the liver than it does for a typical normal woman. And that's yeah. not an attack on anybody. It's just the biological yeah, so it's a biological far. fact that it explains why there's a reason why some people don't and, and, and the gender aspect don't or can't process alcohol like others. Um, do you think there's any other factors in that around processing alcohol or is it, is it, just, is it solely a biological uh, thing? I think it could be social. Um, social. I, I think, I mean, you know, you come up with these ideas because men would traditionally in Ireland meet in the pub. Mm. And apart from that little snug in country pubs or maybe in city pubs as well, but in the old style pubs, except for the snug, women didn't go into pubs. Mm. Um, so through generations of custom or tradition, women would meet with each other and have a cup of tea and mm. men would meet each other in the pub and have the pint. And mm. again, I'm re relying here on, on stereotypes, but I think there was some validity to that. Now that sure. has changed. Changed, sure. Uh, many younger women are very comfortable bellying up to the bar, just like the lads that they went through school or college with. Um, that's changing very, yeah. very quickly. But um, traditionally, women were expected not to be out of control with alcohol. They had to be sensible. They often didn't drink or didn't drink very much. They were stuck at home with kids. The man felt he had the freedom in his own mind to go to the pub and leave the wife home with the, with the children. So, and, and again, I'm well aware that's changed tremendously in the last 40 years or more, yeah. but, but there's still some idea that yeah. it's okay to have this good man's weakness called drink, drink, drink. It's not as okay as it used to be, but there's yeah. a bit of that residue left, whereas women are still expected to probably drink less and most of the time probably do drink less. Mm, interesting. Thank you, Stephen. And just the last uh, point to come to before I'm conscious of time, uh, before we have our concluding remarks is, what, what yeah. kind of I I ideas, I think we've touched on a little bit, or how would you go about, you know, maybe a, a one idea or two, talking to someone within the family who is hiding their uh, uh, alcohol consumption? You know, so I suppose if they're hiding it, uh, it's the, I would infer from the question that the person is aware, you know, themselves, the person who's made the contribution. So someone's aware of it, but in an overall way, they're hiding it. Um, what's your sense of that? It's interesting. 
the nature of alcohol, you heard me talk a little earlier about, it's almost as if alcohol is a voice that tells you you're not drinking as much as you actually are. Mm -hmm. There's almost this, these layers of, of reality. On the one hand, uh, many of my friends drink more than I do, therefore it's okay to drink the amount I'm drinking. But on another level, deep down, I kind of know I'm going overboard, mm. but I don't want to admit it to myself or mm. certainly not my family. Mm. What should the family member do? Is that your question, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, the family member. What, what might they do? Yeah, the family member who they're aware or the, 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 the other person who's engaging in alcohol uh, use is hiding it. Well, I think that one thing the family member needs to do is to take care, good care of themselves. Yes. I mean, alcohol wants to do damage to the person who's drinking too much. And it's a very greedy beast. Alcohol wants to consume the family as well. Mm -hmm. So what I hope will happen is that family members will talk among themselves. Not, I'm not talking necessarily about small children. I'm talking about the family members. The age appropriately, kids. yes. Yeah, age appropriately. And they talk to each other. And it doesn't have to be a formal intervention where someone like me comes in and really facilitates a, a three-hour meeting with the family to challenge that person to go get help in a residential treatment program or, mm. uh, or go to AA meetings, et cetera doesn't have to be necessarily, at least not in the early stages, doesn't have to be that formal and that, but, but to start talking about it, not bickering, not arguing, not nagging, not rowing, but just simply say to the person with the drink problem, Joe, Sally, is this a good time to talk? Uh, mm. oh, well, yeah, yeah. You don't bring this up when someone's heading out the door or you're expecting visitors to arrive in the door. Mm. I'm really worried about your drinking. Mm. This isn't an argument. It's not a fight. It's not an attack. I want you to say it. You prepare what you're going to say. Mm. Say it clearly, directly. And, and you actually say it with love. Like, I really mm. love you. You're really a special human being. I, you've made my life better. But now things, I think, are, are going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be a change. And mm -hmm. said calmly, it's, a, it's a, a message of serious concern, but I care deeply about it. It's not mm -hmm. an attack. And if it's going to be extremely effective, do it in numbers. In other words, if three or four or even two, but preferably three, four, five family members Sit mm -hmm. me down for mm -hmm. an hour or more and challenge me about my drinking. But it's mm -hmm. not just me versus her, and she's picking on me, and you're always on my case, and you're always trying to control me, and you're a nag, and get leave me alone, and you're repeating yourself, and I don't want to hear this, and mm -hmm. I work hard. And you, you want to bypass all that kind of dialogue. Sure, sure. And just as, as two, three, four family members say, Joe, Sally, we love you, we care about you, we respect you, this needs to change. Yeah. And then you hope the person tones it down, sets a safe limit for themselves. If they're not addicted to alcohol, they may be able to maintain a safe limit, one or none, two, one or none, oh, glasses yeah. of wine or beer, glasses yeah. of beer or something. But a safe limit, and if they can't maintain a safe limit, it means they have a serious problem yeah. and should stop yeah. altogether. That's very helpful, Stephen, and thank you very much. I just want to uh, thank you so much for your time, your your wisdom, nice. and your experiences in 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 a career dedicated to supporting people impacted uh, by alcohol and uh, substance misuse, uh, whether it's they themselves and their family members, and uh, just to offer you. Uh, uh, our best wishes in the future work you will no doubt do in the sphere. Oh, oh, um, and, and to thank the contributors and the people who have attended uh, uh, this webinar this afternoon. And just to say that if any of you have been impacted by uh, what we've discussed this afternoon, you know, to, to reach out to um, 
the di different organizations that have been discussed, you know, whether it's a, a, a fellowship or the AA fellowship, or whether it's going for an initial conversation with your general practitioner, whether you're impacted by alcohol uh, misuse, or whether it's uh, you're, you're a loved one who has come to uh, be part of this webinar. We also have a, a survey uh, that we ask people to contribute to after. So when this webinar is finished, in, in a minute or so to uh, offer your feedback. We're very much informed by people's feedback. So we encourage you to complete the survey after um, uh, this webinar and to register for our ongoing monthly webinar series. And you can do so on our website, aware.ie forward slash webinars. And just to say in conjunction with um, World Mental Health Day, which is Monday the 10th of October, the nearest Wednesday to that is Wednesday the 12th of October, we're going to be uh, doing a webinar or conducting a webinar and the title of which is Managing Bipolar Disorder as Best We Can. And joining us at that uh, webinar will be uh, one of the founding members of AWARE, Dr. Patrick McKeown. And we very much look forward to the conversation uh, around how we can uh, manage bipolar disorder as best we can. So just to thank you all very much again, and we live and have a, a lovely afternoon ahead. Cheerio. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.